The next uh, speaker is founding partner, okay. a founding partner at the digital strategy firm Undercurrent. And in March this year, he came out with his first book called Game Frame. Please welcome Aaron Dingnan. So it's, it was uh, nice of Bruce to bring up the magic circle because I want to talk about play. Um, the, the idea here is, is really questioning you know, the idea of design in other contexts for me. So looking at design sort of outside of the places it traditionally plays. And when you talk about game design, that kind of is a discipline all its own, which is actually quite a wild west in its own right. Um, but then taking some of that methodology and putting it elsewhere. Uh, so I kind of want to talk you guys through uh, how we got there. I started with an observation that things were kind of pulling to extremes, which often happens. You know, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And I was noticing that you know, things were getting more interesting and more boring as well at the same time. And people that I sort of you know, considered myself you know, peers and, and cohorts were having moments of intense passion and interest and moments of intense boredom. And when you look into boredom, there's a lot of it going on. And people are expressing it quite freely. Uh, as you'll see here, this is like three minutes of Twitter boredom being shared with, uh, with the world. Um, and it ranges from at home and bored, or bored at work, bored at school, bored out of my mind. Sometimes people are so bored they can't actually finish the sentence. Um, <laughs> like reading the info on the box of uh, uber bored, which I really like. Um, you know, so that's, that's a symptom of, of something, some experience that's gone wrong for them that is not working in some way. And what was really fascinating to me and continues to be is that this kind of talk happens in places that are most important. Right? It's happening at school, it's happening at work, and it's happening at home. So that's, that's troublesome. If that's where people are talking about being bored, they're not talking about being bored at the amusement park or you know, at, the, at the sports practice or playing video games or having sex. Those are, there's not a, lot, a lot of boredom going on there. But there's boredom going on in these places that are sort of so fundamental to who we become, who we are, where real problems are being solved, supposedly. And so that's, that's troubling, uh, troubling data. So I started to look into. Why is this? What are the symptoms uh, uh, that you know, boredom sort of considers itself part of? What are the negative impacts of those types of environments? And I basically found that when you look at what's holding people back from being engaged, from feeling like they're doing something that's meaningful, from feeling like they're achieving their potential, there's really only two kind of groups of phenomenon that are happening there. One is the lack of volition. So the sense that I don't want to do something. Either I don't want to take the trash out, mom, or I don't want to go to, you know, go to school, or I don't want to work the extra hour, or I don't want to solve the problem, I don't want to fill out my expense report, whatever it might be. And that there's a lot of reasons for a lack of volition, but it's a symptom that comes from uh, largely what's in it for me? Why should I do it? What, what's the reasoning behind this? What is, what is the benefit? And how does the short term versus the long term play out? And then you have this issue of lack of faculty which is the idea that I don't know how to do something, right? So I don't, know, I don't know how to pass this test. I don't know how to play chess. I don't know how to design the perfect phone. I don't, I don't know how to beat Apple at their own game. Those frustrations that come up in, in all these environments that sort of take the shape of, I need more instruction. I need more structure. I need more framework. And, and beyond that, I just need more confidence. I need the sense that I can. I need to believe that I can achieve or believe that I can sort of win, so to speak. And so those, those two symptoms kind of define our experience when we see ourselves you know, at a limit point, when we see ourselves held back in some way. It's almost always one or both of those things that's kind of a piece of the puzzle. And so if you sort of start to chase those down, you get a sense of you know, what types of experiences Round one. don't create that feeling. Fight. This is a video by a guy named Robbie Cooper of people playing video games, uh, which he you know, filmed in epic detail. I'll just let you kind of take it in for a minute. <laughs> So <laughs> that goes on. There's like you know 18 minutes of that. Um, it's this face of intense commitment, intense engagement. They're so in it. It's the Michael Jordan, you know, face that everybody sees. You, but you only see that in very, very specific contexts, right? You only see that in, in a few frames. It's right in the middle of the action, right in the middle of something important that's happening, right when someone's fully committed and locked in. And what's kind of interesting about that is that you don't see that face very many places at all. You only see it really in sports and gaming and maybe the bedroom, if you're lucky, 
and that's about it. Um, because, because that face is not, is not something that's easily inspired. It's not something that can be inspired with logic or with, with uh, structure. It has to be inspired by an environment where it feels like the stakes are high, like something important is happening, like I'm completely in the moment. Uh, and, that, and you sort of get that, that overwhelming uh, sense that you're doing it. So what I did in working on the book is kind of figure out, why is that? What, what's causing that face? And how do I get more of that face somewhere else? How do I sort of get that face to show up in other places? And what, what quickly becomes apparent is that real life is full of a lot of unstructured experiences, experiences that have not been well designed, experiences that have been sort of poorly designed. And if you've ever been to a bad mixer or a bad meeting or a bad, had a bad job or a bad retail store, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Someone hasn't thought through all the things that are going to happen to you having the experience. Games, on the other hand, are incredibly structured experiences, right? When you, when you start to play a game, whether it's chess or checkers or Monopoly or Call of Duty or football, somebody thought through how it was all going to go down. There's rules, there's framing, there's structure, there's goals, and you know most likely you're going to have a good experience. If you didn't, that game's probably not going to stick around very long. But the ones that stick around, the ones that continue to engage us, the, the pokers and the roulettes and the monopolies of the world, those things have been designed in such a way that they are almost sure to create a positive experience. And that's, and that's something that's, that's very powerful. So real life, not always satisfying. Games, almost always satisfying. And what's not surprising as a result of that is that games are selling like hotcakes, right? People want to play games all the time because games are almost always satisfying. And if you're someone particularly with a lot of free time on their hands that has the choice between things that are really satisfying and things that aren't, and maybe you don't have to pay rent, you don't have to be responsible, then of course you're going to gravitate towards these things. And the success is meteoric in the last 10 years. The, the industry grows and grows and grows. And we sort of hear about it in the Times, you hear it in the Journal occasionally, but people don't really talk about the scale of the growth and the intensity of it. 10 million downloads of Angry Birds in 10 days, which is part of a larger trend of about 70 million downloads of the game. And this is not, this is not just kids. Like I've, I've sat first class next to people that have a P&L in one hand and an iPad with Angry Birds in the other, and they're playing Angry Birds, forget the P&L. I mean, that's just, that's literally the, the sort of intensity there. 27.2 million units just of the Wii in the United States, that's one in 10 people, not one in 10 households, have a Wii. Some have multiple Wiis in a home, and that's just one platform. And then something like Call of Duty, which is one of those sort of big blockbuster franchises, 55 million copies of a game that's $50 or $60 that have been sold just in that one franchise for that company. And you're routinely seeing week one, day one numbers in the hundreds of millions of dollars per game. So there's a real sort of intense scale to this whole thing. And it makes Hollywood look really silly. And then Hollywood turns around and makes movies out of Call of Duty. So the question becomes, if there's all this popularity around gaming, why is that? And can we look a little bit more carefully at, OK, they're engaging. We get it. They're designed. They're structured. That makes sense. But what is, what's causing the structure? What are the component pieces that really, really matter? And so I took a quick look. This is just a summary of a few of the key pieces of the puzzle. The first one is that there's just a reality about us, a little reality check, that play is nature's learning engine, right? So Bruce mentioned for a second that other species play, that play is sort of so there's something more going on when we're playing. There's communication beyond just sort of something we do in our spare time. And there's actually incredible data about the number of species that play, how they play, and the role that play plays in their upbringing, in their coming of age, in their shaping of their identity, in their sort of flexing of their capacities. And there's a lot of argument about exactly what role play does provide in sort of evolutionary biology sense. But there's no debate about the fact that it must be fundamentally important. Uh, and there's, a, there's a, a doctor by the name of Stuart Brown who, who re recounted a really cool uh, experience in one of his books about play, where he talked about a guy was out hunting, I think in Alaska, with his dog. And uh, one day a bear came by that was obviously emaciated, a very hungry bear on his way to a hunt. And the guy was terrified the bear was going to attack the dog, attack him, and this was going to end badly, and got his gun all loaded up and everything. And as the bear approached the camp, some communication happened between the dog and the bear, and they began to play. And this hungry bear and this fully fed dog played for two hours. And then the bear went off and did his hunt and came back that night. And then the next morning, the bear came back again, still hadn't caught any food, still very, very hungry, played with this dog in the, in the snow, rolled around. I mean, that level of, of uh, significance, it cannot be overstated. Because if, it was, if play was only what you do when you have free time, and it doesn't matter, and it's frivolous, and don't play when you have to get serious, the hungry bear's eaten that dog and probably eaten the guy, too. 
but it must serve a different purpose. If a hungry bear on his way to a hunt stops and plays with another animal, there must be a meaning to that, a reason that's sort of deep-seated in our, in our biology. So I thought that was a really a beautiful story. But it, it's the learning engine, right? So when you think about the scientific method and you think about play, especially the kind of exploratory play that you see at a young age, they're very, very similar. I'm going to poke this thing and see what happens. I'm going to, I'm going to probe. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to play with things. I'm going to see what happens to the world around me when I interact with it. I'm going to try on different scenarios. That's all the same kind of uh, thinking, you know, exploratory thinking that you see in the scientific method. So it's almost a, a bit of a precursor, if you will. The second piece of the puzzle is this idea of flow, which you all are probably more familiar with than my usual audience. But it's, this, uh, it's an idea sort of put forth originally by um, a psychologist by the name of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And, it, and he was basically putting forth the idea that when you look at the way we feel during different experiences, there are experiences that have high challenge and we don't have the skills for, right? And if you have a high challenge and you have very few skills, you have anxiety, right? That's like being put in the CEO seat day one without you know, not even an MBA to your name. Oh my god, what am I going to do? And then there's this other dynamic of if you have really high skills, but the challenge is low, you're bored. That's Tiger Woods playing me in golf. But if you, if you line up the two and you move progressively up the scale as your ability increases, the, skill, you know, the skills increase, the challenge increases too, you experience this thing called flow, which was described as this, this sort of idea of eagerness and directed purpose and focus and intense engagement. And as soon as I read that, I picture the gaming faces, right? So it's that idea of flow that's coming to life in games and comes to life in other places as well, where it's an exact match between I'm on the edge of my ability with my skills to meet this challenge, right? I'm, I'm barely going to be able to make the touchdown. And that kind of intensity, those, those stakes are very, very important to us and seem to, seem to sort of play beautifully with our wiring. That's, we're, we're wired to be totally, totally engaged in those moments. So, so that's another piece of the puzzle. Third is this idea about our seeking circuitry, right? So if you look at the brain and the way it works, there are actually multiple systems for the way we feel. It's not just one kind of binary thing. Although people think about desire and liking and wanting as all one soup, there's actually a little bit of a, of a, of a breakdown there. And this is an oversimplification to make the point. But when you're liking stuff, it's the opioids in your brain, right? That's a cupcake. That's a hit of crack. That's you know, a warm blanket. That's you know, an orgasm. Those are released, and they flood the brain, and they tell the brain, calm down, everything's cool, we got what we need, let's relax. You know, that's, that's sort of that feeling of, like, I'm not going anywhere, I'm very satisfied, I'm, I'm satiated. So it's very much an inhibitory system in the brain that sort of stops everything, and we chill out. We, we have achieved success. The wanting pathway, on the other hand, is more, more connected to dopamine in the brain, which is a little bit more of a pleasure accountant and a lot more interested in what am I expecting to get? If I do this, what will actually happen? What will the outcome be? Am I going to get my bonus at the end of the year? Is the number going to hit black on the roulette table? Am I, am I making sense of the world around me to predict when I'm going to get rewards and taking action to deliver those rewards or to deliver what I need? And so you think about wanting as almost more the life force within us, the desire to get up in the morning and go get, you know, go forage for berries, go hunt that thing, go, go win, essentially, in whatever we're doing. And it's such a powerful system that when they damage the dopamine receptors in a rat's brain that's hungry and they put food in front of it, the rat will not take two steps to eat. It will not progress toward the food. But when they put the food in the mouth of the rat that has do damaged dopamine receptors, it eats it up and loves every minute of it because its liking circuitry is still intact. So that's how powerful and how separate the two, the two systems are. And games are really good at activating our seeking circuitry, which is aligned with the wanting. They're really good at getting us to think about, I'm just going to do one more level. I'm just going to try this one more time. I'm going to go and do one more round on the, on the craps table, honey, and then I'll come up and go to bed. It's that desire to kind of keep going for it. And we see this most potently right now in the way we interact with our BlackBerry. Right? As soon as your phone, you feel the buzz, what is it? I've got to see what it is. Is it, is it some good news? Is it bad news? What is it? There's a sort of a surprise element there. But that's definitely dopamine in your brain going like, What's in the email box? I bet it's something good. I bet it's, I bet it's something good, or I bet it's something bad. And so finally, um, the last idea here is that, uh, is that games, hello, games grow our skills, right? So we all know that, uh, according to Napoleon, uh, girls only want to date guys who have great skills. Now he thought that was nunchuck skills and bow hunting skills and that kind of thing. Not quite the same. But, but there is definitely a desire in our, in our sort of programming to demonstrate and to collect skills, to prove that we're better than average, right? We have you know, biases like illusory superiority and other traits that kind of reflect this. We're very interested in proving that we're better than the rest, right? 
I have to prove in some way, shape, or form that I'm a viable candidate, that I'm you know, worth mating with, et cetera. So there's a desire to be above average. And games give us a chance to sort of be above average at something, right? Even when you lay down that word in words with friends or Scrabble or you get the point across or you, you know, take someone's money in Monopoly, there's a kind of over-enthusiasm for what you're really doing. You take it beyond the point of reality because you're in the magic circle and you're thinking about the stakes so high. But you're like, yeah, I just stuck it to my friend in words with friends. And that has really no significance and no bearing on your mateability as a candidate. But there's, there's programming there that says as long as I'm better at something, someone's going to give a shit. And that's worked well for me. Um, so, so, you know, basically you take those, two, those things and you start to think about, all right, if those are the mechanics that are driving all this, then what can be turned into a game? What can we sort of take from and, and build? And essentially this guy, Daniel Cook, who, uh, who does a lot of game design and a lot of work with Microsoft uh, in the Northwest, came up with a very simple kind of rubric for this. The first is if the activity can be learned, right? If you can actually learn it, if it's not, you know, I can't slam dunk and I'm never going to be able to and no game is going to get me to. But if it can be learned, if it's cooking, if it's mathematics, if it's you know, working, on, working in a certain way, if the player can be measured. So if you can actually put some form of measurement into the situation. And in a lot of cases, things that were not possible to be measured before, we can measure today. right? So you look at a system like Nike Plus. It was really hard to measure running. And now it's a little bit easier. You've got, something that you've got a little pellet in the shoe that's giving you information. And then finally, if feedback can be delivered in a timely fashion. And again, that's where Nike Plus really accelerates, because I'm wearing my headphones, and it says, go faster, you know, because it knows what I'm doing in real time. That's way better than getting home from the run and being like, I wonder how I did. I bet I did pretty well. It's not the same. So those three things are really all the prerequisites you need to turn, in my opinion, anything into the world, any structured experience, into a more game-like experience, and, and as a result, have some of the benefits that go along with that. So one of the things that I put forth in the book is a very simple framework for evaluating the design of any experience. And this is built on kind of a, a hodgepodge of what's going on out there in the game design community and a lot of different levels and a lot of different pieces of, the, of that industry where there isn't a lot of alignment around what makes a game a game or what makes a game good. But there is some alignment when you take a close look at what are the pieces of the puzzle and how do you put them together. And so, Without getting into too much detail here, there's the objective, right? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to save the princess? Are you trying to make a delicious meal? Are you trying to ride 100 miles? What is it? What are the outcomes? If you're successful, if you're not successful, what happens? What's the feedback loop that goes into that? And so then you have your feedback there. What's the activity itself? Are we cooking? Are we riding bikes? Are we jumping? Are we parachuting? Are we skateboarding? Are we doing expense reports? And then down here, the player profile. People do perceive and interact with games and other environments differently. Some of us are very motivated by competition, by that kind of intensity. Others find it demotivating. It's, it creates too much anxiety for them. Some people are really motivated by working in teams. Others prefer to work alone. So thinking a little bit about who are we, working, who are we designing for and how do we want that to kind of impact the nature of the experience. And then in the middle, this thing that I call the skill cycle, which is basically when you think about Monopoly, you do a round of Monopoly. You roll the dice, and you, and you move around, and you make decisions, and the other people make decisions, and then it comes back to you. And that's one round of the game, or one round of poker, or one level of Call of Duty. Same thing here, the skill cycle. So when you look at any other experience, there's probably a way to think about what is a round of that experience. One meeting is a round of meeting. One expense report is a round of expense reports. One, one week of work is potentially a round of that, depending on how long or short you want that experience to be. And then within it, you have the actions, the things you can do, the things you can't do. The black box, which is sort of the rules engine, right? If you do this at work, you're going to get rewarded. If you do that, you're not. If you, you know, show these traits, it'll be good. If you don't, it'll be bad. And then the feedback that you get in real time. So that kind of is swirling around. And these three pieces are really the key pieces that define whether it's a good structured experience or not. The skills, what are we focused on, right? What am I actually getting better at? And a lot of things that look like games, like Farmville, actually aren't games. They're just preying on your compulsions to play because there's no skill at the heart of it. You're not getting better at anything. You're actually just getting better at clicking a button. You might be getting better at the use of conscientious time of checking back in, but that's, that's a borderline bad skill. Resources, what do you have at your disposal, right? So if you're, if you're doing a, a cooking game, what, what ingredients do you have? What tools do you have? And resistance, which is what's holding you back? Success can't be certain, or there's no stakes. There's no sense of flow. So you have to have uncertainty. And actually putting it in there on purpose creates that intensity. So you want to think about Iron Chef, right? Iron Chef limits resources by using a scarcity form of resistance and says, you have to use lobster. And then everyone has to deal with that. So that's kind of a, that's the way that, that shakes down. So to skip ahead, because I'm out of time, 
did a quick example here on expense reports, but you guys get the idea. Um, this is a little bit longer. Basically, there's two options when you look at stuff like this. You can say, all right, knowing about these compulsions, knowing about these psychological triggers, we're going to be mustache twirlers and try to get people to do things like buy our soda and be loyal to our airline and do a bunch of things that aren't necessarily good for them but are good for us. Or we can think a little bit more holistically about building skills into the things that are mutually beneficial for organizations and for people and thinking about building games that actually make us better and turn us into kind of the uber ironing husband here who's got, uh, who's got everything you know, on going 100%. So with that, uh, I, I leave you. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. So, questions? Uh, anybody? Any questions? Right here. Here you go. Yeah. I, I just would really like to see how the expense report is a game. Is there <laughs> any, any chance you could just say a few words about that? Yeah, I can do the 60 second version. Um, essentially, expense reports are free of, uh, of a skills focus and they're free of a progression. So, the, the question becomes, what can, you, what can you add to that process to make it more cumulative and more, more additive to the person's experience? So our, our recommendation there, and it's, very, it's a very shallow one at this point, is to start thinking about after 10 years of expense reports, the person that's been doing them should basically be a junior CFO, right? They should know a lot about financial underpinnings of the business. So maybe you start with just making sure that you get it in on time and you get credit for that and you get some kind of notification that you're on time and you're, you know, you're rewarded for that. And then you start to do correlations, right? Start to correlate what, you know, is it higher expenses on, on business trips adding up to, to more sales or not? So you start to sort of draw connections within a system and it offers you the chance to make those connections. Then maybe it opens up and gives you a little bit of a wider berth. So instead of just your expenses, now you can see your whole department or you can see your whole sort of division. And then you start to do other more advanced tasks with that data as you go forward. Again, not trying to take 15 hours of your week, but just like what can you do in 10 minutes additional to filling it out? It kind of builds the skill level up and get credit for it. And other people in the organization know that you're up to that. And so you're sort of crowdsourcing this data pool of things people are noticing, correlations they're detecting, ways that that impacts the business, and then maybe having some additional sort of off-site discussions about expenses within the business. And then over time, you evolve the system to sort of identify those star players that are doing better and enjoying thinking about it and flexing those skills and give them more, more, uh, more responsibility. And people that aren't enjoying it, maybe they can earn the right to then be done with it. If they have enough weeks in a row where it's perfect, maybe their expense report becomes part of an administrative pool, et cetera. So just kind of structuring that whole act within the business as a meaningful thing, both for the business in terms of insights and accuracy, and for the people in terms of feeling like, wow, I did, I did 20 years of expense reports at IBM, but I actually got something out of it. Like, I really get it now. I really understand what's going on around me. So that's the, that's the high, high level version. And the system Expensify, um, Expensify.com, if you haven't used it, is, is damn beautiful in terms of design. And I think that's sort of going to go the route Mint.com went in terms of changing that industry. So I have high hopes for them to enact some of that thinking. Very good. Perfect. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. <laughs>